It's interesting to note that Ivanhoe was published in 1819, and 10 years later, the English laws became much more liberal on naturalization, and Jews and Roman Catholics could get citizenship, could be, citizenship, uh, could be citizens, and were named to citizenship. So it's very possible that you could look upon Walter Scott's Ivanhoe as a political polemic urging for greater toleration at a time when the issue was being debated, even though it took 10 years from the novel for issues to be raised. And it may be worthwhile to ask yourself how many other novels may have had an impact on legislation in England or in America. We know, for example, that when John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath came out, copies were distributed to members of Congress who were dealing with the problem of migrant farm workers. Uh, I'm sure that improvements in a lot of migrant farm workers has been, in some cases, attributed to the issues raised in the Grapes of Wrath, and may very well be likely that people who were debating the issue of citizenship in England discovered in Scott's novel a very sympathetic treatment of the Jews. Let's review some of these events and see what the novel is about. And again, go through it <coughs> item by item. Before that happens, though, I would like to answer a few questions were raised at the break, and especially for those of you in video land. Tonight, for some of you, I, oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm here while the University of Houston has a night baseball game and the Rockets are playing. But those of you Monday night who are watching on TV, uh, hopefully there's not a prize fight or a basketball game or something that urges you to swift channel, switch channels. March 14th, we're going to have a midterm examination. And I've been asked about that. The examination will deal with the first five novels of this course. Pilgrim's Progress, Moll Flanders, Tristram Shandy, Ivanhoe, and The Red and the Black. You may select four of those novels to be quizzed on. You may exempt one not to be quizzed on. The test will be held from 8.30 to 10 o'clock after the first hour and a half in which I'm going to discuss the red and the black. Some of you will be going to the West Houston campus to take the class where Mrs. Ross, Ms. Rossum will be there to meet you. The others will come to this campus to take the test. A half an hour of the test will be devoted to an objective quiz. You'll have some 80 or 90 questions that will focus on very specific items in the novel. You ought to know that Bois Guibert is a Templar, for example. The Black Knight is Richard Le Lyon. You should know that uh, Mal Flanders steals money from a child, and that the man who sails to America with her is Jemmy. And you ought to know the dates in which these novels were written. You ought to know the birth date and the end date, the, the uh, final date of the authors, simply because it gives us a sense of time and perspective. You know that Defoe, for example, was born in 1660 and died in 1731, and you get dates that you should remember. The last hour of the course, you'll be asked to write two essays, two half-hour essays. One will be on one of the Greases. You may choose one of the Greases, 
and plot for yourself what kind of question you want to answer. It'll deal with how these novels, and choose at least two of them, present one of the graces. How the authors deal with government, or religion, or economics, or art, science, education, social behavior. And then I'll give you a passage or several other questions from which you may choose to write the final half hour essay. I like a lot of details in the answers. I like to count the numbers of details you provide. So if you're asked to write about the Greases and you pick government, the more episodes, the more examples, the more ideas you put on the paper, the healthier my response will be to you. So that is the advice. Now, I'm not sure those of you who are studying at home now have at least a week's notice. Those of you who are in front of me have two weeks' notice. Now let's go back to the essence of this course, Ivanhoe. And let's look at some of the episodes that occur under the theme of government. By the way, any of you who wants to say anything, please don't hesitate to say something. My impression is that Kimberly May and Ms. Mendicello, Ms. Puga are at North Houston or West Houston? Ms. Alexander, Ms. Hydus, Mr. Keach, and Mr. Schmidt. Are you at North Houston or West Houston? All right, I may be having to look at a different list. Ms. Cluse? Yes, here at West Houston. Oh, are there others with you? No, I'm the only one tonight. Well, when you leave, have a Dairy Queen on me. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them. All right, when we look now at the issues of government in Ivanhoe, we realize, of course, on page two, we have the Norman Conquest. And what we have are people arguing about the Normans. Scott writes, a circumstance which greatly tended to enhance the tyranny of the nobility and the sufferings of the inferior classes arose from the consequence of the conquest by Duke William of Normandy. Four generations had not sufficed to blend the hostile blood of the Norman and Anglo-Saxons or to unite by common language and mutual interests two hostile races, one of which still felt the elation of triumph, while the other groaned under all the consequences of defeat. Now, we realize that this is the way the novel starts, because the novel ends with the reconciliation of Cedric and the Normans, because the novel ends with the reconciliation of Ivanhoe and Rowena, we realize that what the novel actually attempts to show that the Norman conquest is now a fait accompli and, be, and the union of Scotland and England, which really doesn't occur until 1707, is already an association which will prove of lasting value. We meet Cedric the Saxon, who is alienated, angry about the Norman conquest. At the bottom of page 15. Uh, in this book, if you don't have this book, there's a, I, I have the pages marked 
that you can follow in your book. If you don't have this book, I'm sorry about that. All right. Cedric answered the prior, Cedric the Saxon, tell me, good fellow, are we near his dwelling and can you show us the road? Gerth, who is there, says the road will be uneasy to find. Answered Gerth, who broke silence for the first time, and the family of Cedric retire early to rest. Now the riders are the Templars, they're arrogant, they are the Normans, and you're seeing here the distinction between the Normans and the Saxons, as the Normans are impolite to Saxon uh, serfs. Tush, tell me not, tell not me, fellow, said the military rider. Tis easy for them to arise and supply the wants of travelers such as we are, who will not stoop to beg the hospitality which we have a right to command. Well, that's pretty solid material. Oh, I know not, said Gerth suddenly, if I should show the way to my master's house, to those who demand as a right the shelter which most are fain to ask as a favor, and they become really angry with this impudent Saxon. Do you dispute with me, slave, said the soldier, and setting spurs to his horse, he caused him make a demi-volt across the path, raising at the same time the riding rod which he held in his hand, with the purpose of chastising what he considered as the insolence of a peasant. Gerth darted at him, a savage and revengeful skull. Uh, I'm sorry, Gerth darted at him a savage and revengeful skull, and with a fierce yet hesitating motion, laid his hand on the haft of his knife. But the interference of Prior Aymer, who pushed his mule betwixt his companion and the swineherd, prevented the meditated violence. Now, you get the idea, of course, how arrogant these Normans are in the early part of the novel. And, of course, they remain so throughout the novel until Richard returns home to unite the country and to give the nation its sense of order again as he reconciled himself to his brother. Page 41, we discover Richard at the just, and we get that page. I'm going to read a few episodes here. says a uh, Wombard, page 41, I think, friend Cedric, said Wamba to the Saxon, that had Richard the lion heart, that had Richard the lion's heart been wise enough to have taken a fool's advice, he might have stayed at home with his merry Englishmen and left the recovery of Jerusalem to those same knights who had most to do with the loss of it. So you get the Saxons expressing more common sense than the Normans in this sense. Page 59. On page 43, we see the difference between the Christians and others. The prior of Jorvaux crossed himself and repeated a paternoster in which all devoutly joined, excepting the Jew, the Mohammedans, and the Templar, the latter of whom without veiling his bonnet or testifying reverence for the alleged sanctity of the relic, took from his neck a gold chain, which he flung on the board, saying, let Prior Aymer hold my pledge, and so on and so forth, as that goes on. All right. We can move off the pad now. Unless you want to copy these down. Okay, I'm sorry. Keep the pad on so that we can copy them. Page 59, you have the perfidious nature of John. Prince John writes, Scott, in league with Philip of France, Cœur de Leon's mortal enemy, was using every species of influence with the Duke of Austria to prolong the captivity, captivity of his brother Richard, to whom he stood indebted for so many favors. In the meantime, he was strengthening his own faction in the kingdom, 
of which he proposed to dispute the succession in case of the king's death with a legitimate heir, Arthur, Duke of Brittany, son of Geoffrey Plantagenet, the elder brother of John. This usurpation, it is well known, he afterwards effected. His own character being light, profligate, and perfidious, John easily attached to his person and faction not only all who had reason to dread the resentment of Richard for criminal proceedings during his absence, but also the numerous class of lawless resolutes whom the Crusades had turned back on their country, accomplished in the vices of the East, impoverished in substance, and hardened in character. So what he says is, a lot of people, a lot of soldiers returning from the Crusades, accustomed to the brutality of the war, turned into uh, soldiers, uh, turned into people who know how to ravage the land, then return to England as criminals. And they themselves decide that without Richard's guiding hand and with John's corruption, they will prevail and they will make a living, though this, a dishonest one. Page 168 has an interesting statement. I would. where uh, we find out how highwaymen are created. Says Scott, the travelers had now reached the verge of the wooded country and were about to plunge into its recesses, held dangerous at that time from the number of outlaws whom oppression and poverty had driven to despair. Now, why are people highwaymen? Why are they burglars? Why are they criminals? because they're either oppressed by the government or forced into crime by poverty. Now, you may agree with Scott or you may disagree with Scott, but the point is he is demonstrating at least some of the reasons why highwaymen are on the road. And, of course, what we're dealing here with is with government, the nature of government and what it's all about. Page 123 in your text. We go back a few pages. News of Richard's release reaches King John, or Prince John. I've been saying king because he's not, he's not king. He's really the prince who's taken over the kingdom from King Richard. Page 123. Here comes a note. From foreign parts, my lord, from, from whence I knew not, said the attendant. The prince looked narrowly at the superscription and then at the seal, placed so as to secure the flux silk with which the billet was surrounded, the letter. It bore the impression of three fleur-de-lis, Richard's seal. John then opened the billet with apparent agitation, which visibly and greatly increased when he had perused the contents and the contents had these words. Take heed to yourself, for the devil is unchained. And the devil, of course, is Richard and John's enemy, John's friends, are warning him that Richard is coming back. The prince, that's John, turned as pale as death, looked first on the earth and then up to heaven, like a man who has received news that sentence of execution has been passed upon him. Recovering, recovering from the first effects of his surprise, he took Waldemar Fitzurst and De Bracy aside, put the billet in their hands successfully. It means, he added, in a faltering voice, that my brother Richard has obtained his freedom. This, of course, is 94. And we know that he's on his way back five years before King John, five years before Prince John is to ascend to the throne. I mentioned to you Irish politics. If you look on page 130, this is in chapter 14. I'll give you the check. It's very early in chapter 14, about the fifth paragraph. The prince sees some Irishmen. Of this fickle temper he gave 
a memorable, excuse me, of this fickle temper. Let me get back to my words. Of this fickle temper, he gave a memorable example in Ireland when sent thither by his father. This is when John didn't do a very good job there. Henry II, with the purpose of buying golden opinions of the inhabitants of that new and important acquisition to the English crown. Upon this occasion, the Irish chieftains contended which should first offer to the young prince their loyal homage and kiss of peace. But instead of receiving their salutations with courtesy, John and his petulant attendants could not resist the temptation of pulling the long beards of the Irish chieftains, a conduct which, as might have been expected, was highly resented by these insulted dignitaries and produced fatal consequences to the English domination in Ireland. So what we're saying, what, what Scott is saying, is that John, in the 1183, when he was assigned to Ireland, insulted the Irish, and the Irish have had animosity toward England ever since. And even today, the Irish free state, which is Roman Catholic, is separated from the northern states who may declare their independence from England, but sustain themselves as a separate entity in the current peace negotiations going on between Ireland and England. Now, Scott here is sympathetic to the Irish. But because he was in Scotland, he would be sympathetic to the Irish. The Scottish, the Scots had better treatment. They had representatives in Parliament. But here he's being sympathetic to them. All right, let's move on. And I'd like to move on to the discussion of religion. We've spent quite a bit of time dealing with that theme. Page 13 of the text deals with the monk of Jorvo Abbey. We're introduced to Isaac York on page 37. I'll give you the chapter numbers. Chapter 5 we're introduced to Isaac of York. And on page 51, Isaac is sleeping at Cedric's castle. And the pilgrim, who is Ivanhoe, warns him that his life is in danger. And on page 54, we do have a statement about the persecution of the Jews. Here is Isaac of York's thoughts on chapter 6. Somewhere around the middle. Isaac's doubts might have been indeed pardoned. That is, he... Oh, excuse me let, me, let me move up ahead one paragraph. The travelers continued to press on their journey with a dispatch which argued the extremity of the Jews' fears since persons at his age are seldom fond of rapid motion. The palmer, to whom every path and outlet in the wood appeared, appeared to be familiar, led the way through the most devious paths, and more than once excited anew the suspicion of the Israelite that he intended to betray him into some ambush of his enemies. So, while he's being led to safety, Isaac is very worried about his safety. And here's what Scott writes. His doubts might have been indeed pardoned, for except perhaps the flying fish, there was no race existing on the earth, in the air, or the waters, who were the object of such an unintermitting, unintermitting general and relentless persecution as the Jews of this period. Upon the slightest and most unreasonable pretenses, as well as upon accusations the most absurd and groundless, their persons and property were exposed to every turn of popular fury. For Norman, Saxon, Dane, and Briton, 
however adverse these races were to each other, contended which should look with greatest detestation <coughs> for Norman, Saxon, Dane, and Britain, however adverse these races were to each other, contended which should look with greatest detestation upon a people whom it was accounted a point of religion to hate, to revile, to despise, to plunder, and to persecute. The kings of the Norman race and the independent nobles who followed their example in all acts of tyranny maintained against this devoted people a persecution of a more regular, calculated, and self-interested kind. It is well no a well-known story of King John that he confined a wealthy Jew in one of the royal castles and daily caused one of his teeth to be torn out until the jaw of the unhappy Israelite was half disfurnished, and he consented to pay a large sum which it was the tyrant's object to extort from him. Well, many examples of this type of torture can be found. And what we're doing, dealing with in Ivanhoe is Scott's sympathetic interpretation of events in which Rebecca becomes the heroine. Now, there are a lot of events we can talk about. We can talk about the Crusades. We can talk about the discussion between the clerk of Coppenmers when he meets the Black Knight at St. Dustin. We can talk about, go back to the pad, thank you. The separation between Bois Guibert, a Christian, and Rebecca, a Jew, and Rebecca's prayers. When he rege she rejects him, the accusation of witchcraft and Rebecca's trial. And then the trial of Rebecca and the malevolence of Beaumanoir. So let's look at those passages because I think the most powerful passages in the novel deal with Rebecca. And we haven't spent any time at all tonight with Rebecca, but Rebecca, of course, is the crux of the novel and her relationship with Bois Guibert becomes the central tension of the novel and its ultimate statement. So let's spend some time now talking about Rebecca. If you turn to page 212, Rebecca is in the custody. She has been kidnapped and she has been held. And this is chapter 24 in the text. We can open to chapter 24 where Rebecca is being accosted by Bois Guibert. And she says to him in chapter 24, she offers him some money. She says, Take these, good friend, and for God's sake, be merciful to me and my aged father. These ornaments are of value, her jewelry. These ornaments are of value, yet they are trifling to what we would bestow to obtain our dismissal from this castle, free and uninjured. So she's really, at this point, asking for her freedom and willing to bribe, willing to pay Bois Guibert for what's happened to her. Fair flower of Palestine, replied the outlaw. These pearls are orient, but they yield in whiteness to your teeth. The diamonds are brilliant, but they cannot match your eyes. And ever since I have taken up this wild trade, I have made a vow to prefer beauty to wealth. Well, we're looking at the most vile of villains at this point. And Bois Guibert becomes a dark villain. There, he's, he's really one-dimensional. I'm not sure we can ever say that he is any more than a uh, pasteboard character. He turns to and says, No bright lily of the Vale of Baca. <clears throat>
It is well spoken, replied the outlaw in French, finding it difficult probably to sustain in Saxon a conversation which Rebecca had opened in that language. But no bright lily of the vale of Baca, that thy father is already in the hands of a powerful alchemist who knows how to convert into gold and silver even the rusty bars of a dungeon grate. Well, she's claiming that her, she's threatening Rebecca by saying her father will be ruined by the man who holds him prisoner. Now, Rebecca's attitude, of course, is interesting. She starts by speaking to him in Saxon. He begins to talk to her in French. In other words, Rebecca, who is a Jew and who is able to accommodate herself to any land, can speak the Saxon tongue, can speak the French tongue, can move from one country to the other easily, and Bois Guibert recognizes her continental nature and her universal presence. He still approaches her. Page 215 in line chapter 24. Let there be peace between us, Rebecca, he said. Peace if thou wilt, answered Rebecca. Peace, but with a space between us. Thou needst no longer fear me. Thou needst no longer fear me, said Bois Guibert. I fear thee not, replied she. Thanks to him that reared this dizzy tower so high that naught could fall from it and live. Thanks to him and to the God of Israel, I fear thee not. And she's going to threaten to jump. Rather than submit to Bois Guibert, she would jump from this tower. And it's a tower, she says, providentially delivered by God to her so that she would not be shamed by an affair with Bois Guibert. He becomes frightened. Thou dost me injustice, said the Templar, by earth, sea, and sky. Thou dost me injustice. I am not naturally that which you have seen me, hard, selfish, and relentless. It was woman that taught me cruelty, and on woman, therefore, I, I have exercised it, but not upon such as thou. Hear me, Rebecca. Never did knight take lance in his hand with a heart more devoted to the lady of his love than Brian de Bois Guibert. She, the daughter of a petty baron who boasted for all his dominions but a ruinous tower and an unproductive vineyard in some few leagues of the barren lands of Bordeaux, her name was known wherever deeds of arms were done, known wider than of many a ladies that had a country for a diary. Yes, he continued, and he begins talking about Adelaide de Montmar, who has turned him bitter, but he loves Rebecca. Page 217, he moves out of the room and then comes back. And she's trembling now because she knows that he is not going to let her go. He re-entered the turret chamber. This is page 217, about four paragraphs on. And descended the stair, leaving Rebecca scarcely more terrified at the prospect of the death to which she had been so lately exposed than at the furious ambition of the bold, bad man in whose power she found herself so unhappily placed. When she entered the turret chamber, her first duty was to return thanks to the God of Jacob for the protection which he had afforded her and to implore its continuance for her and for her father. We move on where circumstances develop and Rebecca Wagiber now realizes there's no way that he can marry this woman. There's no way she'll marry him. He is accused of being overpowered by her He's worried that the Inquisition may condemn him to death for having consorted with a Jew. And so we move to page 346 where we discover the accusation of witchcraft and Rebecca's trial. And these become the moving episodes of uh, Ivanhoe. 
the Grand Master, a man by the name of Beaumanoir, This is chapter 36. It's the beginning of chapter 36. The Grand Master Beaumanoir, who is malevolent, determined to force the Inquisition, determined to bring to justice the conspiratorial and alien Jew, now has Rebecca in his hands and has her there because Bois Guibert, who's proven himself a coward, has literally turned her over to this inquisitor. Look at page 36. Among dissolute and unprincipled men writes, Scott, of whom the temple order included but too many. There are corrupt people even in associations that claim that they are privy to the finest nobles of the land. Albert of Templestowe might be distinguished, but with this difference from the audacious Bois Guibert that he knew how to throw over his vices and his ambition the veil of hypocrisy and to assume in his exterior the fanaticism which he internally despised. Here comes the Grand Master, Lucas Beaumanoir. These sentiments on the part of the Grand Master were greatly shaken by the intelligence that Albert had received within a house of religion the Jewish captive and, as was to be feared, the paramour of a brother of the order. There is in this mansion dedicated to the purposes of the Holy Order of the Temple, said the Grand Master in a severe tone. A Jewish woman brought hither by a brother of religion by your connivance. And he, he goes on to speak. Down on the page. How comes it then, I demand of thee once more, that thou hast suffered a brother to bring a paramour, and that paramour a Jewish sorceress into this holy place, to the stain and pollution thereof. And Bowman Wire now says that here is a man who has been under the spell, who is the paramour of a Jewess, and he accuses her already of being a, uh, a sorcerer. I, brother, a Jewish sorceress, said the Grand Master sternly, I have said it. Darest thou deny that this Rebecca, the daughter of that wretched usurer Isaac of York and the pupil of the foul witch Miriam is now shamed to be thought of spoken lodged within this preceptory well what happens of course is that Beaumanoir who recognizes Rebecca for her beauty is a fanatic is determined to extirpate witches, sorcerers people who can take good Christians and turn them into hypocrites by loving them. You are, she is a sorceress and must suffer as such. She shall not by heaven, said Bois Guibert. By heaven she must and will, said Malvoisin. Neither you nor anyone else can save her. Lucas Beaumanoir has settled that the death of a Jewess will be a sin offering sufficient to atone for all the amorous indulgences of the Knights Templars. And thou knowest he hath both the power and will to execute so reasonable and pious a purpose. While Guibert says, Malvozan, thou art cold-blooded. And then he realizes that he'd better not say anything more because he himself will be accused and suffer, and so he backs off. The accusation of witchcraft occurs on page 346. Bon Beaumanoir makes his charges on page 352, also in, cha uh, in chapter 37. And here are some of the ch charges he makes. 
we have therefore summoned to our presence, says Beaumanoir, a Jewish woman by name Rebecca, daughter of Isaac of York, a woman infamous for sortileges and for witcheries, whereby she hath maddened the blood, besotted the brain, not of a churl, but of a knight, not of a secular knight, but of one devoted to the services of the holy temple, not of a knight companion, but of a preceptor of our order, first in honor as in place. And so everything she has done is more virulent, more bewitching, and more treacherous than anything she has, anyone could have expected because Bois Guibert is among the order one of the holiest casuists and hypocrites we know of, but not the order itself. Yes? If Wagi Bear was a priest, I mean, he couldn't have gotten married anyway, right? No, he's not a priest. He's a Templar. Oh, he's a okay. knight. He's of an order of knights. Yeah, no. Uh, although it's not altogether clear, there was a time in which priests could marry, and I'm not sure at which Lateran Council or which council this was a... Uh, uh, by Chaucer's day, of course, priests could marry. But in this case, Bois Guibert is, is a knight. He's not, he's not a priest. But a good question. You know, we get so many different terms we're unfamiliar with that we really need to have them clarified. So thank you for the question. Among other things, uh, other charges are raised now. Witnesses are called upon to prove that Rebecca is a witch. And let's find out who some of these witnesses are. Uh, you go to page 355. Right, I'm sorry. Go to... Go to page 356, and we see what kinds of witnesses are brought against Rebecca. <clears throat> Bois Guibert, on page 356, this is chapter 37, made an effort to suppress his rising scorn and indignation. We forgive thee, Brian, because we, you know, they assume that he is under her spell. Finally, let those who have ought to witness of the life and conversation of this Jewish woman stand before us. Says Scott, there was a bustle in the lower part of the hall, and when the Grand Master inquired the reason, he discovers that a bedridden man whom the prisoner had resorted and returned to his limbs appears. So someone who had been crippled was healed by Rebecca. The poor peasant, a Saxon by birth, was dragged forward to the bar, terrified at the penal consequences which he might have incurred by the guilt of having been cured of the palsy by a Jewish damsel. So having been cured by her, he's bewitched by her, and he himself may find himself condemned. Uh, perfectly cured, says Scott, certainly he was not, for he supported himself forward on crutches to give evidence. Most unwilling was his testimony, and given with many tears. But he admitted that two years since, when residing in York, he was suddenly afflicted with a sore disease while laboring for Isaac the rich Jew in his vocation of a joiner, a carpenter, that he had been unable to stir from his bed until the remedies applied by Rebecca's directions, and especially a spicy smelling balsam, had in some degree restored him to the use of his limbs. Moreover, she had given him a pot of that precious ointment and furnished him with a piece of money to return to the house of his father near Templestowe. And may it please your gracious reverence, said the old man, I cannot think the dazzle damsel meant to harm me 
though she hath the ill hap to be a Jewess. Peace, slaves, said the Grand Master, and be gone. It well suits brutes, brutes like thee to be tempering and treat. Excuse me. It well suits brutes like thee to be tempering and trinketing with hellish cures and to be giving your labor to the sons of mischief. You shouldn't work for Jews, says Beaumanoir, and uh, the devil has cured you. The peasant, fumbling in his bosom with a trembling hand, produced a small box bearing some Hebrew characters on the lid, which was, with most of the audience, a sure proof that the devil had been the apothecary. Baudemar, after crossing himself, took the box in his hand and learned in, and learned in most of the eastern tongues, read with ease the motto on the lid, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. Strange powers of Satan, said he, which can convert scripture into blasphemy, mingling poison with our necessary food. Other witnesses come up. Two mediciners, as they called themselves, the one a monk and the other a barber. I could tell you a lot of stories about barbers in the early period, in the Middle Ages, the modern period. Barbers talk quite a bit. And this barber will say what he wants to say. They avowed that they knew nothing of the materials excepting that they savored of myrrh and camphor, which they took to be oriental herbs. But with a true professional hatred to a successful pr practitioner of their art, that is, they're going to say something bad about successful competitors. But with a true professional hatred to a successful practitioner, they insinuated that since the medicine was beyond their own knowledge, it must necessarily have been compounded from an unlawful magic pharmacopoeia, since they themselves, though no conjurers, fully understood every branch of their art, so far as it might be exercised with the good faith of a Christian. When this medical research was ended, Scott becomes rather real cynical here, very cynical, very, very uh, ironic. When this medical research was ended, remember he's a lawyer. He knows what testimony is. He knows how it can be twisted. He knows how to turn things around. He knows what cause will convince the jury. When this medical research was ended, the Saxon peasant desired humbly to have back the medicine which he had found so salutary. But the Grand Master frowned severely at the request prevented him from getting it. Now, other evidence of Rebecca's witchcraft is her ability to repair the wounds of Ivanhoe. And we have, a episode, we have an episode about that situation as well. Finally, after these false charges are brought, after she's charged of mumbling incantations in a foreign tongue, after she's charged with handling the blood in unique ways with Ivanhoe, after she's charged of using mysterious medicine from the East, then she has her say. And if you turn to a Rebecca's speech, it comes in... Chapter Templar is willing to 
now realizes he cannot anymore defend her, and he's going to leave her. We part then thus, said the Templar, after a short pause. Would to heaven that we had never met, or that thou hadst been noble in birth and Christian in faith. Nay, by heaven, when I gaze on thee and think when and how we are next to meet, I could even wish myself one of thine own degraded nation. My hand conversant with ingots and shekels instead of spear and shield. There's your difference. The Jews are the money lenders. The warriors are the Christians. My hand, my head bent down before each petty noble and my look only terrible to the shivering and bankrupt debtor. This could I wish, Rebecca, to be near to thee in life and to escape the fearful share I must have in thy death. Well, he's going to have a double share in her death. Not only is he willing to convict her and to bring charges against her and to see her a witch, but he assumes that because she is not converted, she will be doomed in hell as well. And she will be doomed for eternity. What does she say? <clears throat> Thou hast spoken the Jew, said Rebecca. As the persecution of such as thou art has made him. Thou hast spoken the Jew, said Rebecca, as the persecution of such as thou art has made him. Heaven in our has driven him from his country. But industry has opened to him the only road to power and to influence which op oppression has left unbarred. Read the ancient history of the people of God and tell me if those by whom Jehovah wrought such marvels among the nations were then a people of misers and of usurers. And no proud knight we number names amongst us to which your boasted northern nobility is, the, is as the gourd compared with the cedar. Names that ascend far back to those high times when the divine presence shook the mercy seat between the cherubim and which derived the splendor from no earthly prince but from the awful voice which bade their fathers be nearest of the congregation to the vision. Such were the princes of the house of Jacob. She goes on. Rebecca's color rose as she boasted the ancient glories of her race, but faded as she added with a sigh, such were the princes of Judah, now, no, now such no more. They are trampled down like the shorn grass and mixed with the mire of the ways. Yet are there those among them who shame not such high descent and of such shall be the daughter of Isaac, the son of Adonikam? Farewell. I envy not thy blood won honors. I envy not thy barbarous descent from northern heathens. I envy thee not thy faith which is ever in thy mouth but never in thy heart nor in thy practice. There is a spell on me by heaven, says Bois Guibert. I almost think you be yon besotted skeleton spoke truth and that the reluctance which I part from thee had something in the more than is natural. Fair creature, so young, so beautiful, so fearless of death and yet doomed to die with infamy and agony, who would not weep for thee? The tear that has been a stranger to these eyelids for 20 years moistens them as I gaze on thee. He's been a soldier. Soldiers don't cry. But once in his life, he's going to weep before Rebecca. This becomes the essence of, of Ivanhoe. And we have to understand that I think Scott has made a a meaningful story, a telling story, a story of some power as he draws the contrast between Bois Guibert and Rebecca. And I said a few moments ago that Bois Guibert is a pasteboard character, but we see him changing here. We see him realizing his error and realizing the true innocence of Rebecca 
He knows there's no witch, witchery here. He knows there's no sorcery here. He knows that there is but malevolence in those who would condemn her. And so it, it seems a fortuitous event when Bois-Guibert in the just collapses and dies of a stroke. There's no, there's no way he could win. He can't win in the battle. He's not going to win in the court. And his death almost suggests that there is a divine providence protecting Rebecca. Now, in dealing with this novel, let's move on to other aspects of the Greases. We have, I think, about 10 minutes left, and I'd just like to point out to you some of the themes that you would wish to focus on other than the religious theme. Yes. I'm Ms. sorry. Um, the going back to the witch trials. It, now, is is anything like that occurring in England? I mean, I know it's a little bit later in America when the with the Salem witch trials and all that. Is Scott familiar with any of that? I mean, oh, yes. he's a little bit. Is he a little early, or is that? Well, there were witch trials. A uh, James the first wrote a book entitled. Uh, I probably don't have the name correctly at this point the demonologia but he dealt with the problem of witches in the uh, beginning of the 17th century and he uh, he started a whole reaction against witches which led to America the American witch trials were based upon the fanaticism and the uh, attacks on heretics stimulated by James I's book. But by the end of the 17th century in America, the Mathers, who were responsible for it, realized the error of their ways. They even wrote a confession in which they demonstrated and stated that they had been misled into uh, witch trials. But throughout the Middle Ages, even during the Black Plague, the Jews were accused of sorcery. The Jews did not suffer from the Black Plague the way that the, uh, the general population did, among other reasons, because their dietary laws forbade them from eating animals that could carry uh, uh, the fleas and the various other uh, uh, pollution that might lead to disease. For example, the laws of Kashrit the Jews would follow would require that the lungs of animals be examined. If there was tuberculosis or the cancerous growth, you couldn't eat that animal. The animal would, would not be available or could not be considered uh, suitable for kosher meat. And consequently, great care was taken in providing meats and foods for the Jews during the Middle Ages such that they, uh, they didn't suffer the, the losses that the Christian population suffered. Because they stayed alive, they were accused of, in fact, perpetrating the plague. There are examples throughout the Middle Ages. I don't have them here, and I, 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 but, but the, the uh, Joan of Arc, Oh, you know, no. I was mainly concerned about how it's contemporary to Scott and what's going on in the 18th century that's going to compare to the witch trials. I mean, I know that, that the uneducated country folk were very superstitious. No, there were no, no, there were no as far as I know, no witch trials in a uh, Scott's day. But press the button down again. Remember, I told you that the blood accusation still, still existed, and that in Russia, at the end of the 19th, uh, early part of the 20th century, uh, the blood accusation was brought against Mendel Bayliss, so that while there were no witch trials, there were other ways of trying to condemn people's uh, beliefs.
The novel has a great deal more for it in addition to this particular richness. The description of Cedric's castle on, 45, on page 45 in, in the book gives us a sense of what a Saxon palace, a Saxon castle might have looked like, page 45. And I should have some pictures for you, but at this point I haven't been able to gather all this material. In chapter 6, we discover that there are four silver candelabras with waxen torches. And if you go to chapter 7, you get a description of the justing site, what it was like. The openings for the entry of the combatants were at the northern and southern extremities of the lists, accessible by strong wooden gates, each wide enough to admit two horse horsemen riding abreast. So you get some sense of the architecture, not only of the castle, but of the justing site. If you're dealing with aesthetics, the beauty of Rebecca herself becomes a descriptive detail. Remember what she looks like. She, she and Rowena both attract people's attention. Page 74 on the uh, chapter 8, there's an interesting point. I'd like to read it because in this section of art and architecture and aesthetics, we get a passage which is essentially an elegy. An elegy is a poem or a piece of work that deals with a passage of time. And I'd like to read this just to give you a sense of Scott's ability to realize when things remain alive and when things die. He's describing knights walking into the justing area, into the tournament. At length the barriers were opened and five knights chosen by lot advanced slowly into the area a single champion riding in front and the other four following in pairs. All were splendidly armed and my Saxon authority in the Warder manuscript records at great length their devices, their colors, and the embroidery of their horse trappings. It is unnecessary to be particular on these subjects. He says... Their escutcheons, however, have long moldered from the walls of their castles. Their castles themselves are but green mounds and shattered ruins. The place that once knew them knows them no more. Nay, many a race since theirs has died out and been forgotten in the very land which they occupied with all the authority of feudal protectors and feudal lords. What then would it avail the reader to know their names or the evanescent symbols of their martial rank? Time has passed. The swords are rusty. The shields are rusty. The castles are ruins and overgrown with weeds. This is what happens to heroic people. Pride ultimately has but one option, and that's the grave in which no one ends. Maintaining his pride, maintaining his power, maintaining his wealth, maintaining his glory, maintaining his kingdom. We have the description of Isaac's home, pages 95 and 96, chapter 10. In pages 155 to 156, Scott goes back to his interest in balladry. He gives us some ballads, some English ballads, to help us understand the times. He gives us the Crusader's Return on page 156, chapter 17. 
is anyone here who's a good ballad singer? I'd sing it, but then you would leave earlier than you should. High deeds achieved of knightly fame from Palestine, the champion came, the cross upon his shoulders borne, battle and blast had dimmed and torn. Each dint upon his battered shield was token of a folked in field, and thus beneath his lady's bower he sung as fell the twilight hour. It becomes a ballad, so you get a sense of the balladry that informs the medieval romance. This is the soldier returned from the Crusades. Look at the last verse. Joy to the fair, my name unknown, each deed and all its praise thine own. Then, oh, unbar this churlish gate, the night dew falls, the hour is late. Inured to Syria's growing breath, I feel the north breeze chill as death. Let grateful love quell maiden shame and grant him bliss who brings thee fame. This is a soldier talking. He said, here I am back from battle. I fought in Syria where it was warm. I fought the Crusades. I'm a hero. I came back from Desert Storm. And now your gate is locked. Let me have your love. Don't feel shamed. You're giving yourself to a man of fame. And so the ballad has, I can, I can hear uh, Clint Black singing it in the Astrodome. Warrior cowboy returned home. Throughout this book, every time you hear Rebecca mention, someone refers to her as a lily, a lily of the veil. And of course, we're reminded then of the Song of Songs, where the beautiful woman Solomon brings to his palace. She's, she's in the field. And she has a lover, and her brothers don't like her lover. And so they bring her into the vineyard where Solomon sees her and takes him to his palace. And then the issue is, where, the, the issue is for Solomon to try to win her. She prefers her shepherd. And after trying to entice her and trying to win her beauty, referring to her as a lily of the valley, valley Solomon realizes that he cannot have her love, and so she is permitted to leave with her shepherd. You, you, remember, you, you remember that when you hear the warrior is singing for his love, you hear Guibert desiring Rebecca being rejected. And so this novel not only has historical overtones, it has biblical overtones, it has historical overtones, and while you may find some of it artificial, and while you may find some of it one-dimensional, you may even find Waverly to be a better novel of Scott's, and I don't doubt it is. I think this novel gives us so much information about how the historical process works and how the writer of historical fiction deals with his materials that it gives us a sense of the feel. Now, one problem with historical fiction is this. It's a very interesting problem. Irving Stone's the Presence Lady, the story of Rachel Jackson, and others. Gladys Schmidt's Confessors of the Name, which describes the declining Roman Empire, or her book David the King. These are examples of historical fiction. We like to read them to get a sense of background. The problem when we read them is trying to discover how much we should ignore, because it doesn't give us a real sense of the history. Or it doesn't give us history, it's invented history. So the question is, when you read a book like this, do you want the plot and do you want the story? And are you willing to sacrifice your sense of historical accuracy for events and conversations invented? Or are you willing to, or are you going to abandon historical fiction and just read the 
prose and letters of historians who don't try to recreate conversations. You have to be very wary when you read historical fiction not to, uh, to understand that a lot of the details have never been stated and are not historically accurate. But Scott, for the most part, holds to his, holds to historical uh, uh, truth. Now, we have a few moments left. I have some examples of science and technology, the justing scenes, the armor that Franck de Boeuf wears. By the way, there is. I'm looking for the light to flash. I don't know whether we're coming to the end or we're not coming to the end. <laughs> we have four minutes. There's a, there's a very humorous scene. I'd like to read it because it just shows the difference between the Normans and the Saxons. And I have this under science and technology. It has to do with the way people look at language. Excuse me. No, I, I can't find that right now, and I'm looking through my sheets. In science and technology, in military science, we have the scene where Ralph de Vipont is rendered senseless in the battle. We have the fight between the disinherited knight, who is Ivanhoe, and Brienne de Bois Guibert. We have the scene where Ivanhoe is taken to Rebecca to cure, and under science, she does serve to cure him. She is a forbidden attraction to Ivanhoe. He sees this fantasy helping him. He thinks that maybe she is a beautiful thing, but then realizes that they are from different worlds. When we move into the issue of social behavior, you get early in the novel the clothing of a Saxon leader. And you get the Saxons carrying a ram's horn. You know, ram's horn is a long device. Uh, presumably, uh, Joshua blew the ram's horn to signal the collapse of the walls of Canaan. When I was at the British Library some years ago, there was a large elephant's horn, which had been used at the Battle of Bannockburn be between the Scottish and the English. And it was sold by a family that had held it hundreds and hundreds of years. I think the selling price was $3 million. And all it was was a large horn that you could blow on, but it had gone from the Scotch to the English and back during the battles. And it had three silver bands. One was a silver band that showed animals. Another was a silver band that showed fruit. And I'm not sure what the other silver band was. But it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, yeah, I was driving in a cab in London and mentioned to the cabbie because I read it, had read it in the newspaper that that cost $3 million. And he said it was a good price. He said, after all, today we had bought some planes for $7 million, and they won't last as long as this horn lasted that was used at the Battle of Bannockburn. Next week we'll be discussing a French novel. We'll move in to The Red and the Black. We'll spend a day on that and then a half a day the following week and then you'll have a midterm exam. Thank you. I think we're through.